The Pharsalia by Lucan, Book Nine, Part Two. Before the doors, the eastern peoples stood, seeking from Horn Jove to know their fates. Yet to the Roman chief they yielded place, whose comrades prayed him to entreat the gods, famed through the Libyan world, and judge the voice renowned from distant ages. First of these was Labienus. Chance, he said, to us the voice and counsel of this mighty god has offered as we march. From such a guide to know the issues of the war and learn to track the Sirtes, for to whom on earth, if not to blameless Cato, shall the gods entrust their secrets? Faithful thou, at least, their follower through all thy life hast been. Now hast thou liberty to speak with Jove, ask impious Caesar's fates and learn the laws that wait our country in the future days. Whether the people shall be free to use their rights and customs, or the civil war for us is wasted, to thy sacred breast, lover of virtue, take the voice divine, demand what virtue is, and guide thy steps by heaven's high counselor. But Cato, full of godlike thoughts, born in his quiet breast, this answer uttered, worthy of the shrines: What, Labienus, dost thou bid me ask? Whether in arms and freedom I should wish to perish rather than endure a king, is longest life worth worth aught, and doth its term make difference? Can violence to the good do injury? Do fortune's threats avail, outweighed by virtue? Doth it not suffice to aim at deeds of bravery? Can fame grow by achievement? Nay, no Hammond's voice shall teach us this more surely than we know. Bound are we to the gods; no voice we need. They live in all our acts, although the shrine be silent. At our birth and once for all, what may be known, the author of our being revealed. Nor chose these thirsty sands to chaunt to few his truth, whelmed in the dusty waste. God has his dwelling in all things that be, in earth and air and sea and starry vault. In virtuous deeds, in all that thou canst see, in all thy thoughts contained, why further then seek we our deities? Let those who doubt and halting tremble for their coming fates, go ask the oracles. No mystic words make sure my heart, but surely coming death, coward alike and brave, we all must die. Thus hath Jove spoken. Seek to know no more. Thus Cato spake, and faithful to his creed, he parted from the temple of the god, and left the oracle of Hammon dumb. Bearing his javelin as one of them, before the troops he marched. No panting slave with bending neck, no litter bore his form. He bade them not, but showed them how to toil. Spare in his sleep, the last to sip the spring, when at some rivulet to quench their thirst, the eager ranks pressed onward. He alone, until the humblest follower might drink, stood motionless. If for the truly good is fame and virtue by the deed itself, not by successful issue, should be judged. Yield, famous ancestors, fortune not worth gained you your glory, but such name as his. Who ever merited by successful war or slaughtered peoples? Rather would I lead with him his triumph through the pathless sands and Libya's bounds than in Pompeius' car three times ascend the Capitol or break the proud Jugurtha. Rome, in him behold his country's father, worthiest of vows, a name by which men shall not blush to swear. Whom shouldst thou break the fetters from thy neck, thou mayst in distant days decree divine. Now was the heat more dense, and through that clime than which no further on the southern side the gods permit they trod, and scarcer still the water till in middle sands they found one bounteous spring which clustered serpents held, though scarce the space sufficed. By thirsting snakes, the fount was thronged, and asps pressed on the marge. But when the chieftain saw that speedy fate was on the host, if they should leave the well untasted, vain he cried, your fear of death, 
drink, nor delay. Tis from the threatening tooth men draw their deaths, and fatal from the fang issues the juice if mingled with the blood. The cup is harmless. Then he sipped the fount, still doubting, and in all the Libyan waste there only was he first to touch the stream. Why fertile thus in death the pestilent air of Libya? What poison in her soil, her several nature mixed, my care to know, has not availed? But from the days of old, a fabled story has deceived the world. Far on her limits, where the burning shore admits the ocean fervid from the sun, plunged in its waters, lay Medusa's fields untilled, nor forest shaded, nor the plough furrowed the soil which by its mistress' gaze was hardened into stone. Forcus, her sire, malevolent nature from her body first, drew forth these noisome pests, first from her jaws, issued the sibilant rattle of serpent tongues. Clustered around her head the poisonous brood, like to a woman's hair, wreathed on her neck, which gloried in their touch. Their glittering heads advanced toward her, and her tresses kempt, dripped down with viper's venom. This alone, thou hast, accursed one, which men can see, unharmed, for who upon that gaping mouth looked and could dread? To whom who met her glance, was death permitted? Fate delayed no more. But ere the victim feared had struck him down, perished the limbs while living, and the soul grew stiff and stark ere yet it fled the frame. Men have been frenzied by the fury's locks, not killed and Cerberus at Orpheus' song ceased from his hissing, and Alcides saw the hydra ere he slew. This monster born brought horror with her birth upon her sire, Forcus, in second order god of waves, and upon Ceto and the Gorgon brood, her sisters. She could threat the sea and sky with deadly calm unknown, and from the world bid cease the soil. Born down by instant weight, Fowls fell from air, and beasts were fixed in stone. Whole Ethiop tribes who tilled the neighboring lands, rigid in marble stood. The Gorgon sight no creature bore, and even her serpents turned back from her visage. Atlas in his place, beside the western columns, by her look, was turned to rocks. And when on snakes of old, Phlegrian giants stood and frighted heaven, she made them mountains and the gorgon head, born on Athena's bosom, closed the war. Here, born of Danae and the golden shower, floating on wings Parasian by the god, Arcadian given, author of the lyre and wrestling art, came Perseus, down from heaven swooping. Selenian harp did he bear, still crimson from another monster slain, the guardian of the heifer loved by Jove. This to her winged brother, Pallas, lent, price of the monster's head. By her command, upon the Liby limits of the Libyan land, he sought the rising sun, with flight averse, poised o'er Medusa's realm, a burnished shield of yellow brass upon his other arm, her gift he bore, in which she bade him see the fatal face unscathed. Nor yet in sleep lay all the monster, for such total rest to her were death so faded. Serpent locks, in vigilant watch, some reaching forth defend her head, while others lay upon her face and slumbering eyes. Then hero Perseus shook, though turned averse, trembled his dexter hand. But Pallas held, and the descending blade shore the broad neck whence sprang the viper brood. What visage bore the gorgon as the steel thus reft her life? What poison from her throat breathed, from her eyes, what venom of death distilled? The goddess dared not look, and Perseus' face had frozen, averse, had not Athena veiled with coils of writhing snakes, the features dead. Then with the gorgon head the hero flew, uplifted on his wings, and sought the sky. Shorter had been his voyage through the midst of Europe's cities, but Athena bade to spare her peoples and their fruitful lands. For who, when such an airy courser passed, had not looked up to heaven? Western winds now sped his pinions, and he took his course o'er Libya's regions from the stars and suns veiled by no culture. 
Phoebus nearest track, there burns the soil, and loftiest on the sky, there falls the night, to shade the wandering moon, if o'er forgetful of her course oblique, straight through the stars, nor bending to the north, nor to the south, she hastens. Yet that earth, in nothing fertile, void of fruitful yield, drank in the poison of Medusa's blood, dripping in dreadful dews upon the soil, and in the crumbling sands by heat matured. First from the dust was raised a gory clot in guise of asps, sleep-bringing, swollen of neck. Full was the blood, and thick the poison drop that were its making. In no other snake more copious held. Greedy of warmth that seeks no frozen world itself, nor haunts the sands beyond the Nile, yet has our thirst of gain, no shame nor limit, and this Libyan death, this fatal pest, we purchase for our own. Hemorrhoius huge spreads out his scaly coils, who suffers not his hapless victim's blood to stay within their veins. Chersidros sprang to life to dwell within the doubtful marsh, where land nor sea prevails. A cloud of spray marked fell Chilider's track, and Sencris rose, straight gliding to his prey, his belly tinged with various spots unnumbered, more than those which paint the Theban marble. Horned snakes with spines contorted, like to torrid sand, immodities of hue invisible, soul of all serpents, sky-tail to shed in vernal fro frosts his slough, and thirsty dips us, dread Amphisbena with his double head tapering, and Natrix who in bubbling fount fuses his venom, greedy Prester swells his foaming jaws, Piraeus head erect furrows with tail alone his sandy path, swift Jaculus there, and Seps whose poisonous juice makes putrid fle flesh and frame, and there upreared his regal head, and frighted from his track, with sibilant terror all the subjects sw swam. Baneful ear darts his poison, basilisk, in sands deserted, king. Ye serpents, too, who in all other regions harmless glide, adored as gods, and bright with golden scales, in those hot wastes are deadly, poised in air, Whole herds of kine ye follow, and with coils, encircling close, crush in the mighty bull. Nor does the elephant in his giant bulk, nor aught find safety, and ye need no fang nor poison to compel the fatal end. Amid these pests undaunted Cato urged his desert journey on, his hardy troops, beneath his eyes, pricked by a scanty wound, in strangest forms of death unnumbered fall. Tyrrhenian Aulus, bearer of a flag, trod on a dipsus, quick with head reversed, the serpent struck, no mark betrayed the tooth, the aspect of the wound nor threatened death, nor any evil, but the poison germ, in silence working as consuming fire, absorbed the moisture of his inward frame, draining the natural juices that were spread around his vitals. In his arid jaws set flame upon his tongue, his wearied limbs no sweat bedewed, dried up the fount of tears, fled from his eyelids, tortured by the fire, nor Cato's sternness, nor of his sacred charge, the honor could withhold him, but he dared to dash his standard down, and through the plains, raging to seek for water that might slake the fatal venom thirsting at his heart. Plunge him into Nias, in Rhone and Po, pour on his burning tongue the flood of Nile, yet were his fire unquenched. So fell the fang of Dipsus in the torrid Libyan lands, in other climes less fatal. Next he seeks amid the sands all barren to the depths for moisture, then returning to the shoals, laps them with greed. In vain, the briny draught scarce quenched the thirst it made. Not knowing yet the poison in his frame, he steals himself to rip his swollen veins and drink the gore. Cato bids lift the standard lest his troops may find in thirst a pardon for the deed. But on Sabellus yet more piteous death, their eyes were fastened. Clinging to his skin, a seps with curving tooth of little size, he seized and tore away, and to the sands, pierced with his javelin. 
small the serpent's bulk. None deals a death more horrible in form. Swift, for swift the flesh, dissolving round the wound, bared the pale bone, swam all his limbs in blood, wasted the tissue of his calves and knees, and all the muscles of his thighs were thawed in black distillment, and file membrane sheath parted that bound his vitals, which abroad flowed upon earth. Yet seemed it not that all his frame was loose, for by the venomous drop were all the bands that held his muscles drawn down to a juice. The framework of his chest was bare, its cavity, and all the parts hid by the organs of life that make the man. So by unholy death there stood revealed his inmost nature. Head and stalwart arms, and neck and shoulders from their solid mass melt in corruption. Not more swiftly flows wax at the sun's command, nor snow compelled by southern breezes. Yet not all is said. For so, to noxious humors, fire consumes our fleshly frame. But on the funeral pyre, what bones have perished? These dissolve no less than did the moldered tissues, nor of death thus swift is left a trace. Of Afric pests thou bear'st the palm for hurtfulness. The life they snatch away, thou only with the life the clay that held it. Lo, a different fate! not this by melting for a prester's fang nisidius struck who erst in marcian fields guided the ploughshare burned upon his face a redness as of flame swollen the skin his features hidden swollen all his limbs till more than human and his definite frame one tumour huge concealed a ghastly gore is puffed from inwards as the virulent juice courses through all his body which thus grown his course that holds not. Not in cauldron so boils up to mountainous height the steaming wave, nor in such bellying curves does canvas bend to eastern tempests. Now the ponderous bulk rejects the limbs, and as a shapeless trunk burdens the earth, and there, to beasts and birds, a fatal feast, his comrades left the course, nor dared to place, yet swelling, in the tomb. But for their eyes the Libyan pests prepared more dreadful sights. On Tullus, great in heart, and bound to Cato with admiring soil, soul, a fierce Hamoroes fixed, from every limb, as from a statue saffron spray is showered in every part, there spouted forth for blood a sable poison, from the natural pores of moisture gore profuse, his mouth was filled, and gaping nostrils, and his tears were blood. Brimmed full his veins, his very sweat was red. All was one wound. Then piteous Levis next, in sleep was victim, for around his heart stood still the blood congealed. No pain he felt of venomous tooth, but swift upon him fell death, and he sought the shades more swift to kill, no draught in poisonous cups from ripened plants of direst growth Sabaean wizards, wizards brew. Lo, upon branchless trunk a serpent named by Libyan's Jaculus, rose in coils to dart his venom from afar. Through Paulus' brain it rushed, nor stayed, for in the wound itself was death. Then did they know how slowly flies, Flung from a sling the stone, How gently speed through air The shafts of Scythia. What availed, Morris, The lance by which thou didst Transfix a basilisk? Swift through the weapon ran The poison to his hand. He draws the sword And severs arm and shoulder at a blow, Then gazed secure upon his severed hand, Which perished as he looked. So hadst thou died, and such had been thy fate. Whoe'er had thought a scorpion had strength or, or death or fate, yet with his threatening coils and barb erect he won the glory of Orion slain. So bear the stars their witness. And who would fear thy haunts, Salpuga? Yet the Stygian maids have given thee power to snap the fatal threads. Thus nor the day with brightness, nor the night with darkness gave them peace. The very earth on which they lay was they feared, 
nor leaves nor straw they piled for couches, but upon the ground, unshielded from the fates, they laid their limbs, cherished beneath whose warmth and chill of night the frozen pests found shelter, in whose jaws, harmless the while, the lurking venom slept. Nor did they know the measure of their march accomplished, nor their path, the stars in heaven, their only guide. Return, ye gods, they cried, in frequent wail, the arms from which we fled. Give back the salia, sworn to meet the sword. Why lingering fall we thus? In Caesar's place, the thirsty dips us in the horned snake. Now wage the warfare. Rather let us seek that region by the horses of the sun, scorched and the zone most torrid. Let us fall, slain by some heavenly cause, and from the sky descend our fate. Not Africa of thee, complain we, nor of nature. From mankind cut off this quarter, Teeming thus with pests she gave to snakes, And to the barren fields denied the husbandmen, Nor wished that men should perish by their venom. To the realm of serpents have we come. Hater of men, receive thy vengeance, Whoso of the gods severed this region upon either hand, With death in middle space. Our march is set through thy sequestered kingdom, and the host which knows thy secret seeks the furthest world. Perchance some greater wonders on our path may still await us. In the waves be plunged, heaven's constellations and the lofty pole stoop from its height. By farther space removed, no land than Juba's realm, by rumor's voice, drear, mournful. Haply for this serpent land there may we long, where yet some living thing gives consolation. Not my native land, nor European fields I hope for now, Lit by far other suns, nor Asia's plains. But in what land, what region of the sky, Where left we Africa? But now with frosts, Cyrene stiffened, Have we changed the laws which rule the seasons In this little space? Cast from the world we know, Neath other skies and stars we tread, Behind our backs the home of southern tempests, Rome herself, perchance, now lies beneath our feet. Yet for our fates this solace pray we, That on this our track, Pursuing Caesar with his host may come. Thus was their stubborn patience of its plaints Disburdened, but the bravery of their chief Forced them to bear their toils. Upon the sand, all bare, he lies And dares at every hour fortune to strike. He only at the fate of each is present, flies to every call, and greatest boon of all, greater than life, brought strength to die. What power had all the ills possessed upon him? In another's breast he conquers misery, teaching by his mien that pain is powerless. Hardly, aid at length, did fortune, wearied of their perils, grant. Alone, unharmed of all who till the earth, by deadly serpents dwells the Silian race, potent as, potent as herbs their song, safe is their blood, nor gives admission to the poison germ, e'en when the chant has ceased. Their home itself, placed in such venomous tract and serpent thronged, gained them this vantage and a truce with death, else could they not have lived. Such is their trust in purity of blood, that newly born, each babe they prove by test of deadly asp for foreign lineage. So the bird of Jove turns his new fledglings to the rising sun, and such as gaze upon the beams of day, with eyes unwavering, for the use of heaven he rears, but such as blink at Phoebus' rays, cast from the nest. Thus of unmixed descent, the babe who, dreading not the serpent touch, plays in his cradle with the deadly snake. Nor with their own immunity from harm, contented do they rest, But watch for guests who need their help against the noisome plague. Now to the Roman standards are they come, And when the chieftain bade the temp tents be fixed, First all the sandy space within the lines With songs they purify, and magic words From which all serpents flee. Next round the camp, in widest circuit From a kindled fire, rise aromatic odors, Danewort burns, and juice distills from Syrian galbanum. 
than tamarisk in costum, eastern herbs, strong panacea mixed with centauri, from Thrace, and leaves of fennel feed the flames, and thapsus brought from Eryx, and they burn larch, southern wood, and antlers of a deer which lived afar. From these in densest fumes, deadly to snakes, a pungent smoke arose, and thus in safety passed the night away. But should some victim feel the fatal fang upon the march, then of this magic race were seen the wonders, for a mighty strife, rose twixt the psylian and the poison germ. First with saliva they anoint the limbs that held the venomous juice within the wound, nor suffer it to spread. From foaming mouth, next with continuous cadence would they pour unceasing chants, nor breathing space, nor pause, else spreads the poison, nor does fate permit a moment's silence. Off from the black flesh flies forth the pest beneath the magic song. But should it linger, nor obey the voice, repugnant to the summons, on the wound prostrate they lay their lips, and from the depths, now paling, draw the venom. In their mouths, sucked from the freezing flesh, they hold the death, then spew it forth, and from the taste shall know the ta snake they conquer. Aided thus at length, wanders the Roman host in better guise upon the barren fields in lengthy march. Twice veiled the moon her light, and twice renewed, yet still with waning or with growing orb saw Cato's steps upon the sandy waste. But more and more beneath their feet the dust began to harden till the Libyan tracts once more were earth, and in the distance rose some groves of scanty foliage and huts of plastered straw unfashioned, and their hearts leapt at the prospect of a better land. How fled their sorrow! How with growing joy they met the savage lion in the path! In tranquil leptus first they found retreat, and passed a winter free from heat and rain. When Caesar, sated with Amathea's slain, forsook the battlefield, all other cares neglected, he pursued his kinsmen fled, on him alone intent. By land his steps he traced in vain. Then, rumor for his guide, he crossed the sea and reached the Thracian strait, for love renowned, where on this mournful shore rose Hero's tower, and Hella, born of cloud, took from the rolling waves their former name. Nowhere with shorter space the sea divides Europe from Asia, though Pontus parts by scant division from Byzantium's hold, Chalcedon oyster-rich, and small the strait through which Propontus pours the Euxine wave. Then marveling at their ancient fame, he seeks Sigeum's sandy beach and Samoyas' stream, Ritium noble for its Grecian tomb, and all the heroes' shades, the theme of song. Next by the town of Troy, burnt down of old, now but a memorable name, he turns his steps, and reaches for the, searches for the mighty stones, relics of Phoebus' wall. But bare of age, forests of trees and hollow moldering trunks press down Asarcus' palace, and with roots wearied possess the temples of the gods. All Pergamus with densest break was veiled, and even her stones were perished. He beheld thy rock, Hesione, the hidden grove, and Chyses' nuptial chamber, and the cave where sat the arbiter, the spot from which was snatched the beauteous youth, the mountain lawn where played Oinone. Not a stone but told the story of the past. A little stream, scarce trickling through the arid plain he passed, nor knew twas Xanthus. Deep in grass he placed, careless his footstep, but the herdsman cried, Thou treadst the dust of Hector! Stones, confused, lay at his feet in sacred shape no more. Look on the altar of Jove, thus spake his guide, God of the household, guardian of the home. O oh, sacred task of poets, toil supreme, which rescuing all things from allotted fate, dost give eternity to mortal men. Grudge not the glory, Caesar, of such fame. For if the Latian muse may promise aught, long as the heroes of the Trojan time shall live upon the page of Smyrna's bard, 
so long shall future races read of thee in this my poem, and Pharsalia's song live unforgotten in the age to come. When by the ancient grandeur of the place the chieftain's sight was filled of gathered turf, altars he raised, and as the sacred flame cast forth its odors, these not idle vows gave to the gods. Ye deities of the dead, who watch over Phrygian ruins, ye who now Lavinia's homes inhabit, and Alba's height, gods of my sire Aeneas, in whose fanes the Trojan fire still burns, pledge of the past, mysterious palace of the inmost shrine, unseen of men, here in your ancient seat, most famous offspring of Eulus race, I call upon you, and with pious hand burn frequent offerings. To my emprise give prosperous ending. Here shall I replace the Phrygian peoples. Here with glad return, Italia's son shall build another Troy. Here rise a Roman Pergamus. The said, he seeks his fleet and eager to regain time spent at Ilium, to the favoring breeze spreads all his canvas. Past rich Asia born, roads soon he left, while foamed the sparkling main beneath his keels, nor ceased the wind to stretch his bending sails, till on the seventh night the Pharian beam proclaimed Egyptian shores. But day arose, and veiled the nightly lamp, ere rode his barks on waters safe from storm. Then Caesar saw that tumult held the shore, and mingled voices of uncertain sound struck on his ear, and trusting not himself to doubtful kingdoms of uncertain troth, he kept his ships from land. But from the king came his vile minion forth upon the wave, bearing his dreadful gift, Pompeius' head, wrapped in a covering of Pharian wool. First took he speech, and thus in shameless words commends the murder. Conqueror of the world, first of the Roman race, and what as yet thou dost not know, safe by thy kinsman slain. This gift received from the Pelaean king, sole trophy absent from the Thracian field, to crown thy toils on land and on the deep. Here in thine absence have we placed for thee an end upon the war. Here Magnus came to mend his fallen fortunes. On our swords, here met his death. With such a pledge of faith, here have we bought thee, Caesar. With his blood, seal we this treaty. Take the Pharian realm, sought by no bloodshed. Take the rule of Nile. Take all that thou wouldst give for Magnus' life. And hold him vassal, worthy of thy camp to whom the fates against thy son-in-law such power entrusted. Nor hold thou the deed lightly accomplished by the swordsman's stroke, and so the merit. Guest ancestral he who was its victim, who his sire expelled, gave back to him the scepter. For a deed so great thou'lt find a name, or ask the world. If t'was a crime, thou must confess the debt to us the greater, for that from thy hand we took the doing. Then he held and showed unveiled the head. Now had the hand of death passed with its changing touch upon the face. Nor at first sight did Caesar on the gift pass condemnation, nor avert his gaze, but dwelt upon the features till he knew the crime accomplished. Then when truth was sure, the loving father rose, and tears he shed, which flowed at his command, and glad at heart, forced from his breast a groan. Thus by the flow of feigned tears and grief he hoped to hide his joy else manifest. And the ghastly boon sent by the king disparaging, professed, rather to mourn his son's dissevered head than count it for a debt. For thee alone, Magnus, he durst not fail to find a tear. He, Caesar, who with me and unaltered spurned the Roman Senate, and with eyes undimmed looked on Pharsalia's field. O oh, fate most hard! Didst thou with impious war pursue the man whom t'was thy lot to mourn? No kindred ties, no memory of thy daughter and her son, touch on thy heart. Didst think perchance that grief might help thy cause mid lovers of his name? 
or haply, moved by envy of the king, griefs that to other land, hands than thine was given to shed the captive's life-blood, and complaints thy vengeance perished and the conquered chief snatched from thy haughty hand? Whate'er the cause that urged thy grief, t'was far removed from love. Was this, forsooth, the object of thy toil, o'er lands and oceans, that without thy ken he should not perish? Nay, but well was reft from thine arbitrament his fate. What crime did cruel fortune spare? What depth of shame to Roman honor? Since she suffered not, perfidious traitor, while yet Magnus lived, that thou shouldst pity him. Thus by words he dared to gain their credence in his assembled grief. Hence from my sight with thy detested gift, thou minion to thy king, worse does your crime deserve from Caesar than from Magnus' hands. The only prize that civil war affords, thus have we lost, to bid the conquered live. If but the sister of this Farian king were not by him detested, by the head of Cleopatra had I paid this gift. Such were the fit return. Why did he draw his separate sword, and in the toil that's ours, mingle his weapons? In Thessalia's field gave we such right to the Pelean blade? Magnus, as partner in the rule of Rome, I had not brooked, and shall I tolerate thee, Ptolemaeus? In vain with civil wars, thus have we roused the nations, if there be now any might but Caesar's. If one land yet owned two masters, I had turned from yours the prows of Latium. But fame forbids, lest men should whisper that I did not damn this deed of blood, but feared the Farian land. Nor think ye to deceive. Victorious here I stand, else had my welcome at your hands been that of Magnus, and that neck were mine, but for Pharsalia's chance. At greater risk, so seems it, than we dreamed of, took we arms. Exile and Magnus threats, and Rome I knew, not Ptolemaeus. But we spare the boy. Pass by the murder. Let the princeling know we give no more than pardon for his crime. And now, in honor of the mighty dead, not merely that the earth may hide your guilt, Lay ye the chieftain's head within the tomb, with proper sepulture appease his shade, and place his scattered ashes in an urn. Thus may he know my coming, and may hear affection's accents, and my fond complaints. Me sought he not, but rather for his life, this Farian vassal, snatching from mankind the happy morning which had shown the world a peace between us. But my prayers to heaven no favoring answer found, that arms laid down in happy victory, Magnus, once again I might embrace thee, begging thee to grant thine ancient love to Caesar, and thy life. Thus for my labors with a worthy prize content, thine equal, bound in faithful peace, I might have brought thee to forgive the gods for thy disaster. Thou hadst gained for me from Rome forgiveness." Thus he spake, but found no comrade in his tears, nor did the host give credit to his grief. Deep in their breasts they hide their groans, and gaze with joyful front, O oh, famous freedom, on the deed of blood, and dare to laugh when mighty Caesar wept. End of Book Nine